historic uh, moment in time where this, what we're doing here as far as the movement, as far as teaching something that, that's really never been, this is foreign to our people. Many, many, many of us never seen anything like this. And for myself, I mean, I'm not an expert in reading uh, codices, and I don't think uh, even even with all the information that exists, we would never know exactly what what was interpreted as far as the the, the information on, on these books. Because if we know what different characters mean, but in in, in the totality, it was described. It, it, I mean, there was someone relaying this information. I mean, it's not like, uh, even when they tell you, oh yeah, we know, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that they know. There's so much stuff in it, I mean, even with all the scholars and scholarly work that's been done and, and the, writer, the writers and everything, it never be deciphered, and, and it's because, you know, this was cut short. It was, it was destroyed and, and we would never know. I mean, but we know some of it, which is, is better than nothing, so for us, uh, the reason why we came up with this idea of doing the codices is because this is basically the, the ammunition of our people. This is the ammunition of the information that we gather because a lot of the, what does the codex, uh, what does it represent as far as contemporary times? It represents the information extracted to write a book on the so-called Aztec machine. And this is what they, 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 they look at, at, at these books. They, they're always referencing uh, literature like this. If you, if you find someone that's supposedly like a, a person that's really involved in, in, in learning or, or teaching about the history of the Mexica, so-called Aztec, any scholars, any writers, anyone that's really serious about the, 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 the subject, if they don't know about any of something called the Florentine Codex or, or the Borgia Codex or any of these, of these codices, um, then they're not really serious. The codex is what it means. That a codex is a, it's, a, it's an ancient book, an ancient book that, that was uh, manually written, and it wasn't it just it, it's actually obviously a, a, a word, a European word, but it's basically the a codex is it's something a manuscript that was written by hand or painted before the, the printing press. For us, it's obviously um, a codex is um, you know an ancient book of our people that was written down on, on with characters as far as pictographic, like in, a, in an animated way, and um, that we use to you know, describe different events of our lives, different, different subjects, if, whether it was someone in, in, in Platanoco, a merchant, that needed to document all this information, they wrote a codex. We had someone write it for them. If it was a, a priest, you would bring in someone called a Tlacuilo. Tlacuilo is a, a writer, or Tlacuiloque, or, or, or writers, or scribes, really. And they'll come and they, 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 they receive the services of these, of these people because they were experts in, in what they did. And uh, I'll go more into it after. But yes, we are in a, in, in a, in a historic uh, time here because, you know, this is the stuff. We have, uh, the Mexica movement, as far as books, we have thousands of them. But these are the most precious. This is like, almost like you bring in, you bring in a, a, a Jewish person and a Jewish person brings a Torah. Or a, 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 an Arab, a Arab person brings the, the Quran. These are very highly uh, uh, important books for our people. I, I, uh, this, this, this um, for example, this is a volume of 12 books. And when I first uh, got involved with the movement, and I remember, I don't know what the Florentine Codex was. And when Aline explained what, what it was, I remember buying it. And I kept it safe on a, on a place I go, in case something does happen, I go, I tell my kids, Remember, take those books. You know, the house is burning down. You take those books, because we gotta we gotta approach it that way. Because I remember, uh, if, if, imagine a, a Jewish person at his home where he's got a Torah, which they read, and that's that's what foments them as a human being. That's what shows them who they are as people, right? We gotta see it that way because we had a past, a glorious past, and that past is 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 written down on these books. Imagine if we didn't have these books. What a terrible condition we'll be. Literally, we'll be out there as slaves. Literally, physically. You know? And, and, and for the fact that we have this information, it's almost, it, it's almost it, it's disheartening because not a, lot of our, not a lot of our people are interested in this. Most of these people that, that wrote this information down or have been studying this are, are, are either European, Anglo, or 
well, they're from other nations. And it's very, and people, people say, oh, you, are, you guys always rely on European written books. Well, yeah, because some of these people actually had the luxury of doing this. And as you will find it in the, in the presentation, most of these books were in collectors, by like collectors that, that, that were not Nicantlaca. And some of these, these uh, collectors were, were personal uh, people that collected antiquarians, people that collected a lot of these books, and they ended up selling them. And some of them, they were Mexican, and they, had to, they ended up selling them, their kids ended up selling these books. So, for example, in here in, 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 in the U.S., in, in, in Texas, there's a library which has a lot of maps. Of the pre, pre uh, I'm sorry, their, their post, post invasion, meaning after the invasion, and, and there's a whole collection there. As you will see a lot of these books, they're all, they're replicas, they're called, they're called, they're called uh, um, um, facsimiles, meaning they're, they're, some, of, some of these books were done as copies of another copy, and, and those copies were made of other copies. And because maybe the original copy got, got lost or burned, because a lot of the, 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 the Europeans did, they did burn a lot of our books. This was in central Mexico, it was called um, um, uh, Anahuac by, by a, pa, a father of friar named Sumatra, and then Landa, they were the Landa in the Mayan area, and who knows what other books got burned. Because they, 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 you understand that for, for them, this information, as far as after the destruction of our, of our civilization, for them it was. They wanted to destroy who we were as a people. And they realized, they said, well, you know, we keep these books around. They're going to start learning, you know, who they are, their past, their, their, their teachings, and everything. We just want to abolish everything, wipe it out. So, some of, luckily, some of them survived, and there's only, there's very few, and there are not even over 20 books, um, uh, 20 original pre, pre invasion codices that survived out of, imagine, thousands, maybe millions of books out there. There were, there were, there were, you know, um, around and what people used to relay this information. So anyways, yeah, we find ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a great, in a great time where we're actually, you know, we, we do have this, these sources. And uh, how long do you think things have, the, the whole collection has taken to, to collect? 20 years. 20 years. I remember buying this copy, they only made 1,200 copies of this of Warranty Codex, and I remember it was still 600, like about $600? 300 But it, 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 it varied, right? Back and yeah. forth? Yeah. Um, which one do you say is the most expensive? Well, right now, the last one. The Lienzo de Tlaxcala. The Lienzo de Tlaxcala, they only made three, three copies. The, 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 the original copy. No, uh, the, the 100. Oh, I'm sorry, no, but I'm saying as far as the, 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 the actual, oh, the actual, the actual yeah. I'm meaning that a lot of these are replicas, obviously, you know, but they're worth a lot of money because, you know, you're talking about 200, 300, 100, 500, uh, 600, maybe 1,000, like, look at the codex for look at the, the, the size of, of, this codex, of this codex, but it gives you an, an, a, a, an idea of how they were, I mean, the, the vaccine is unbelievable, you can see the leather pieces here, I mean, it's just, it's like if you have your own, because after the European invasion, uh, the, 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 even the images start changing because of, of the whole um, um, influence, the whole schooling of how, how the, the, our, our generation, new generations that were being born, were, were being su subjected to, to, to European propaganda, the European art, and, and that's, I'm going to get into this whole thing, it's just the, the whole history, even the whole history of the courtesies, how they ended up here, how they ended up there, who bought them, who did this, who did that. It's just, it's just overwhelming. Because there's many people in, in, in play here, many, many people who bought them, who stole them, who, who, who ended up in Europe because the, 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 we don't know exactly how some ended up over there. We know someone tried to get burned because they ended up at some kid, at some, some um, I think the Borgias, they had their children were, were playing with one of some of these courses. I mean, you're talking about the, the real sources. And they got burned, and someone just said, hey, wait a minute, that was a really nice source. And they, they ended up actually rescuing the, the, the Borchek Codex. So anyways, um, yes, and, and, and these, are the, these are the main sources, and these are the main uh, argument of, of, of our people. This is, this is it. This is where we come and gather, extract the information. And when people say, well, no, it's not, they don't really 
happen like that at all. You know, it doesn't say. It says so right here. And this may be the first time in the history of the world where all of these books have been brought together in one room. As you were saying, they're in Paris and they're in uh, England and Spain and different places. But nobody's ever brought them all in the world right, you're, you're, so they can see how much they're You're there. absolutely right. If you look at YouTube, if you look at this, uh, uh, there's not one, they're, they're, they're always talking about one point. In fact, there was just a symposium that, that took place where they, they were talking about the 14 codex and they gathered about 10 scholars. Someone came from back east, someone came from Mexico. And they went in, they, they, they scrutinized some of this stuff. I mean, really, you know, detailed stuff. And, and I said, wow, you know. And But some of these people take the, 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 the approach of just a scholarly work. For them, it doesn't, it doesn't mean really, it just, it's just like they, they're toying around. They like this and, oh, okay, okay, look at this. Here's what the, the colors, there's so many colors. They actually tell you how many, how many images are there, how many uh, um, folio, how many this, how many that. So, so it's, it, okay, so, so we know that. But this, the approach that they take is, okay, that's, that's not those Hindus, that's not those Indian people. As I mentioned, the, the Jewish person studying uh, the, their Torah and they say, oh, it's these Jews. <laughs> no, they're talking about themselves. They say, look, this is our past. That's the difference. It's just like when Olivia mentioned the story about when he first went to the Tehuacan. When they walked up there, they said, if their dad would have said, look at what the, 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 our people built, instead of saying, mira lo que, es que, lo que hicieron los niños. See, that's the difference. Because we're seeing it as like, we're foreigners. You know, we're seeing it as like, okay, well, we can do anything. We're not part of that culture. We're not part of that, of that creation. We're, so that's what we, we find ourselves in the condition that we're in. That's why we speak in, in ignorance, we speak as, you know, like if we were European, we speak as, as the, we were, uh, and, 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 you know, it's like this, this, this um, bipolar, because one time we're European, and then when it's convenient, we're Indian. Mm -hmm. Or we're, you know, but, but that's, I just a little, a little bit, you know. Um, now with the whole the racism coming about, I mean, I remember years ago, they used to say, oh, yeah, these people, have, these, these Indians, and all of a sudden when we started asserting our identity and they realized, oh yeah, they do look Indian. And they said, no, they're European. They're Spanish. See, now it's convenient for them to say that we're Spanish descent. You know, only because we started claiming, claiming that this is our land, this is our continent. So you see that the, 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 the spin that they're trying to do on us? Because, you know, it's dangerous. This, this information is dangerous for, 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 for people. It's not dangerous for us. It's empowering. This is this is this is a weapon of, of knowledge here. Because with this, you know, yeah, they can take it because it's a, it's material. But you know, once you read through it, that's why we encourage you, you guys that are the, the, the young ones, get into learning what this is. You know, take classes, get involved, become a scholar, and eventually we teach this and say, like, what's in here? You know, become uh, uh, learn about this because you know, I I I gone through some of this stuff and it's just overwhelming. You know, I I, I think I think it's been like four months, just going through every book, every book, and I, I'm not I'm not gonna say I know everything. I'm I mean, just I'm just trying to get the basics. Okay, what it is, okay, because it's too much, too much information. Especially you know you got other things to do at home and stuff like that. But I'm saying. For the young ones, you know, get, get with the ball, you know, start learning, okay, this is what, okay, so look at, look at this imagery. It's unbelievable. And a lot of this stuff is just stuff that, this represents the, the some scientific stuff our people, our people want to relay. And, and, you know, here we are, looking at this document here. All we know is a priest. All we know that there, there, there was someone Writing this, obviously, it becomes, it, it, it's a document. Imagine you're looking at information from a scientist from NASA. NASA and you're looking at the document. What does it mean? You know? Because it wasn't obviously for a merchant. It wasn't for someone that, you know, oh, okay, well, I'm going to put uh, some sort of, uh, you know, information that's really relevant. It, it, it meant something. It meant something. It's, and, it, and, it's, and it's powerful. Just like this, the same way here. 
I titled the, the, the presentation The Treasures of Anican Placa People, Codices Manuscripts, Lienzos, and Other Sources of the Mexica Movement by Neliolo Torteca. The pictures were taken by Yacuica Tlacaere, who did a great job with his, with his uh, abilities and camera. So, we're talking about codex, a codices, plural, codex, singular. Um, our people had books before the European invasion. Um, most, most of our people don't realize that there was writing involved in, in, in within, within our nation, within our people. Uh, we call these, uh, these books that were called Amoshtin. Uh, Amoshtin means singular book. Amoshtin means books. Um, there was also, there was actually a name also for the, for the in the Mayan area, uh, for um, the people that wrote these books. Uh, the people that wrote these books in, 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 in the, Nican, in the Nahuatl, Nahuatl speaking area, I mean in the valley of, of, of what's called Mexico right now, or Anahuac, um, they were called, they were called Tlacuilos. Now, I'll describe what a Tlacuilo is. Uh, right off the bat, we gotta talk about what, why is it that we don't know what these, these codices are, what are these most these books, what, uh, what, ha what happened to, 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 to these uh, books if we, um, you know, a lot of our people don't realize that we had literature, most of us, our grandparents never told us, our great grandparents, obviously, we never collected any, any of this information, you know, and obviously there was a, there was a reason why, is, as we, we'll go through the presentation. But just keep in mind that, that uh, the Amosh, there was an Amosh Kali. Amosh Kali means book, Kali means structure, meaning the structure where the books were held. And uh, th there, were, there were a lot of these books, uh, we don't know obviously the, the right, uh, exact amount of books, but they got burned, they got destroyed. Uh, some of them were in the mine area by, uh, by this Diego de Landa, the this, this Spanish priest, and, and um, and some of them in the, in, the, in the valley of what's called the Nahuatl, in the valley of Mexico, with the Mexica, the Nahuatl speaking of our people. And it was done by Juan de Sumar, another, another Spanish priest. We don't know what other books got burned. Most likely, uh, ev everywhere the Europeans uh, uh, realized that there was literature, they destroyed it because they don't want to, um, for them it was the destruction of our, of our, of our civilization, the destruction of our, of our of our culture, the destruction of our, of our practices, uh, rituals and ceremonies and all this that they wanted to abolish. So only, only two pre-colonial, pre-invasion codices in Mexico or Anahuac, one of them being the Codex Colombino, a hundred original that are, are held at this, um, at, it's a Biblioteca Nacional de um, Antropología e Historia, um, there's a hundred uh, original, and a post, I mean, post, there's a hundred post-invasion codices there, and ninety that are just copies of other codices. Um, when did the, the codex uh, making stop? Post-invasion codices stopped in the mid 1700s. Um, before that, there was a boom of codices actually from 16 uh, from 1600 to 1700, and and only this boom came about because our people realized that Europeans were taking control of, of some of our land, and for them, um, they had to they had to provide some sort of information because Europeans were basically demanding, okay, well, this is your land. How do you know this is your land? You know, uh, even in, in, in most cases, uh, uh, well, actually, I should say, in some cases, it didn't work. Europeans, no matter what, took our, took certain possessions, and. Uh, Basically, the courses were were, were re, uh, reaffirming uh, our people's possessions, our people's uh, um, uh, lineage to that land that they held for obviously thousands of years. So it, you, you can imagine some of our people had to go and and find a scribe from from the, from certain town or city, uh, so they could have them um, write this information based on oral history, based on, on any any documentation, anything that did. They showed that they they actually were legitimate to that soil, and there's conventions. There's conventions on how to read a codex. There's ways of how to read this codex or codices. Um, obviously, these conventions were were 
because you can imagine the codices were written for thousands of years. So, so our people understood these conventions. They, they, um, there's ways of reading them, um, but obviously there's, there's, there was have, there had to be a person in reading these codices. Um, uh, one one convention is called a bus, bustrofedon, bustro, bustrofedon. It's a Greek word which is basically saying you start from this um, um, side and then you, you, you go down this either either um, horizontal or parallel. I'm saying horizontal vertical. So as you can see on the left hand side, you see how the the, the bustrofedon works. It's, that's the way you follow the, the reading of a codex. You start from the right side. And you go up, it makes a left, it comes down, you make another left, and you go up again. And on the right hand side, you see the, the, the way the codices are read. Some of them are read from, from right to left, some from left to right. And for, more, for the most part, they're read from, from right to left. Um, also, the other convention is its footsteps. And, and um, you know, where, where it's guiding you with little, actually, little, little footsteps. It's like, duh, follow footsteps. <laughs> And then, so, so that, that is a, the one convention that's obviously very simple. And larger images and, and of, of, of were of more importance, and, and then basically it's telling you, okay, start here. Like for example, on, on, on the Codex Mendoza, uh, I don't know if you can see it from here, but you see it on, on, there's an eagle, obviously, that's, that's of importance. And you realize, okay, well, there's something going there, something's happening there. But then behind the eagle, there's a there's a there's a, a man sitting down, and this man, this man is 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 uh, painted black. You know, he's sitting down. He's painted black, and we know that a person that's painted black is is, is a priest, because there was a, there was a metaphor, there was an idea of why they were painted in, in black, and it's a little bit larger. If you notice that that image is a little bit larger than the other the other uh, uh, rulers or leaders. That are sitting, and there was also the idea that you sit down, and, and if you sh and if your feet, the bottom of your feet show, then then that meant that you were part of royalty, you were part of leadership. Um, there was um, little icons on top of the head that demonstrated, that showed what um, um, what your name was through through imagery. So the Tlaquilo, the Tlaquilo, who is this Tlaquilo? The Tlaquilo is a scribe, the, the writer, the Tlaquiloque, the, 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 the people that provided the, 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 the hand that drew these amazing books. And the Tlaquilo was the artist, the scribe who put the images together. In the Mayan area, the scribes Tlaquilos are known as the Atsi. The Tlaquilo had to have and know the convention, learn the process, not just how to paint or draw, or what to draw. Um, the the, the Laquilo had to know the topography, the culture, a sense of history, theology, and all the canons or conventions to be a successful scribe. The Laquilo was most likely commissioned by a priest, a leader, to paint and to, to transcribe this information into images so the story could be, in, could be related later on. So the Laquilo is, you can imagine a uh, Laquilo had to either develop this, this, uh, this, this metaphor, or develop this idea and put it in print. And, and it's not an easy thing. I mean, just to, just to you know, develop something, you know, to, to, to put it in, in imagery, it's, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of difficult. So the Tlaquilo, as we know now, you know, you see the little speech coming out of the Tlaquilo, that means obviously that, that meant that you were talking. That there, there's there's a, a speech coming out of your mouth. There's words coming out of your mouth, and um, as you you'll see in some of the codices that um, that we're going to show here, the Mixteco or the Mixte, oddly enough, does not have a speech clip. I mean, there's other clips that, that are you know you know that 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 um, fall into this convention, but but there's no speech clip. And that's interesting, but the, the, the Mishte codices go back thousands of years before the Mexica codices, which we are looking right now, that's, that's basically an image of a Mexica, the, 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 the imagery of the, of the Tlaquilo, it's, it's, but it's obviously contemporary image. But you look, at, you look at the glyphs, for example, on the right-hand side, the white glyph meant that you spoke Nahuatl. 
the glyph on the bottom with, with specks or, or freckles or dots meant that you spoke Nahuatl, was, but it was broken Nahuatl. Mean, that also meant that you were a foreigner or that you were not uh, um, of that area, meaning that you probably spoke Mayan, Otomi, or, or Mixtec. The blue part of, of, of the speech cliff meant that you were part of, of um, the, the leadership, that you were either a Tlatoani or someone in, in charge. And then the red, obviously, what does red mean? It, means, it meant red is like, you're mad. You know, you do. Estabas enojado when you were speaking, you were, you were angry. But then, then you look at the other, like, at the other uh, speech clip there, and there's, there's kind of like an imagery of flowers. That meant that you were, you were speaking in a very allegorical way, or when maybe there, there was poetry coming out of your mouth. You were a poet. But then there's also the, the speech clip that were, that were elongated, and I've seen some of these speech uh, speech glyphs in, in, the, in the Teotihuacan area. There's like the other the other area that which, which actually use speech glyphs, and they're long. And also, it could also mean that there was a long speech. Obviously, it makes sense. 